Hello and welcome back to our series exploring Korean studies at the University of Edinburgh, where people can find out more about the department, Korean studies academics, current research students and the postgraduate courses that are on offer. Today I'd like to introduce Dr Holly Stevens, who is a lecturer in Japanese and Korean studies here at Edinburgh. Dr Stevens received her PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania in 2017 and her research interests include economic history, agriculture, empire, everyday life, village organisations and the emergence of the modern state. She's currently working on a monograph project entitled Empire by Association, the reorganisation of the rural economy in modern Korea, which examines the changes to Korean agriculture from the late 19th century through the colonial period amidst immense political upheaval. Dr. Stevens also teaches the postgraduate modules Korean History, Culture and Society and the Political Economy of Korea's Development and also contributes to undergraduate Asian Studies modules. So thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. No, that's great. Um, so first question, um, as I just said, you completed your PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, but I wondered if you could maybe provide a broader overview of your education and career path, particularly how you became interested in Korean studies and why you chose to pursue a doctorate in history in particular. Yeah, so sure. Um, so I guess, well, the secret, which is not really a secret, if I'm going to share it on, on the video here, um, is that I hated history as a teenager. I didn't even study it for GCSE. Um, so my path into Korean history, it came from the language side. I did my undergrad in undergraduate degree in Japanese studies and then I enjoyed that so I did a master's in Korean studies to try and complement that and it was while I was doing the master's that I realized that a lot of different things happened in modern Korean history um, and so I became really interested in, in the question of how we untangle some of the experiences of empire, of industrialization, urbanization, war, authoritarian rule and democratization. I just wanted to know or to try and understand how and why people have understood some of the connections between these you know, big, big scale events, um, as well as the stories that people tell themselves to try and make sense of their own lives amongst all of these changes. And it turns out that that is history, <laughs> trying to understand how and why things change. Um, so I accepted my, my fate and I went and did the PhD. Um, but yeah, that's one of the, the things that I try to encourage students to recognize um, in teaching the undergrads, especially on our you know, uh, compulsory history classes. I know it can seem dry and dusty from personal experience. I've been there, um, but I really want to hope that yeah, I can I can get students to recognize and, and get interested in some of these bigger questions. Um, yeah, I think that's that's really true. And I think it also shows the importance of keeping quite an open mind as well in terms of you don't actually know what you'll be interested in. I mean, I know for myself at the start of the MSc, I knew I was just interested in Korea and Korean studies and you sort of discover your niche along the way. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's uh, that's that's really useful. OK, so um, just moving on to the next question. So as I mentioned, again, you're course coordinator for uh, two postgraduate modules, Korean History, Culture and Society and the Political Economy course. So in your view, why are these subjects, and I guess polit particularly political economy, wh why are they so important for Korean studies students to understand? Yeah, so these classes, I mean, I teach both of them and obviously they have their own um, distinct emphases. Um, but as you may recall from taking the classes, it, it's almost impossible to fully separate the two. Um, so in my history classes, I end up talking a lot about the economy um, and vice versa in the political economy class. You know, I try to bring in this historical perspective a little bit. Uh, and that's partly because economic development, like it has been such a major issue in the post-war history of both North and South Korea alike. Um, you know, there's this major emphasis on, on state planning, trying to 
develop and compete economically between the two Koreas. Um, and so from a you know, historical perspective, we can't ignore the influence of industrialization or economic development, even if we're interested in, you know, different topics like culture or religion or gender, um, still comes back to, or we can still trace the influence of, you know, some of the, the political emphasis on economic development through these different fields. Um, and recognizing that, I think, leads us to think you know, find some very interesting connections and influences um, within these different fields as well. So I try to open um, that avenue for students. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the political economy side, um, it's important to think about Korea or to recognize this within Korea um, as well, because Korea is just this wonderful test case for some of these theories of political economy. Um, you know, like one of the big jobs of economists and political scientists and social sciences, it is to try and, you know, develop these theories to understand the world. But we also then need to think critically about these theories, understand where they're coming from and why they take on, you know, some of these uh, different emphases at different moments in time. Um, and Korea, less so these days, more um, political scientists and social scientists are, you know, paying a lot of attention to Korea. Um, however, historically, <laughs> Korea didn't always receive the most attention um, in some of this, you know, political and economic theorizing. And, and so it's a really good example to compare these theories, you know, to to get this theoretically informed case and, and see, you know, how does this compare to what actually happened in Korea, you know, and then that not only tells us, you know, information about Korea, but it also helps us learn more about these theories and these ways of understanding development. Um, you know, we can see when and why they diverge. That tells us a lot about our own assumptions about the world as much as it does about Korea. Yeah, no, I think that's because I think one of the most useful exercises in the political economy module was pulling together that table of theories and kind of mm -hmm. comparing them in a Korean context. And as you say, not only understanding about Korea, but understanding these theories kind of wider applicability as well. So, yeah, no, that, that's great. Uh, turning now to methodology, um, and I guess it's kind of also connected to what you said about bringing history to life or sort of understanding certain things in a historical context. So I know that your research has included the examination of farmers' diaries. Um, firstly, how did you decide to use that sort of methodology and sources in your research? And what was the process of acquiring and accessing your sources, first of all? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so, I mean, that wasn't ever really a conscious decision. <laughs> um, I knew I wanted to get uh, as much local detail um, to try and contrast with documents produced by the, the central government during the colonial period. Um, so I knew I was interested in agriculture um, because that was like, you know, the main occupation of the majority of the population throughout colonial rule. So I wanted to see, you know, what changes are taking place. And a lot of the documents during that period are produced by the colonial government. But, I mean, there's always a gap between, you know, central government high level plans and then, you know, what actually happens um, between like lower levels of administration or just activity, day to day life. Um, but this is especially, you know, a concern when we're thinking about the colonial period where these, you know, planners in Tokyo and Seoul, like, they don't necessarily even have the language um, to talk to Koreans, let alone consider what they're thinking. And so I really wanted to try and find, you know, just local history sources that might try and capture a bit of that gap. Um, so when I went to Korea to do my fieldwork, I basically visited a lot of uh, professors working on local history within South Korea. Um, so I visited Hamani, uh, uh, Ha Youngnan, Kim Pildong, um, Woo Dae Hyung, Kim Hyung Suk, Lee Kyung Nan. Um, these were these 
your professors, they were very generous um, with their time, just explaining to me about their research, because a lot of these guys, they're engaged in, you know, developing some of their own archives of local history, as well as, you know, doing their own research as well. Um, so sometimes they were even generous enough to share some of their sources with me. Um, and so that was really helpful hearing about how they've been approaching it, their experience with it. When they failed to find the documents that I was looking for, that really saved me a lot of time. Um, wow. Knowing that, you know, the, these professors who have so much more experience, um, you know, they saved me a lot of time. Ultimately, I didn't find the initial set of documents that I was looking for. I wanted to find um, the documents from the financial associations, so the Kumiungto Hap or the Kinyu Kumiai. I was unable to find those, but I was fortunate in that a lot of the, or several of the um, big uh, Korean studies institutes, like the National Institute of Korean History and the Academy of Korean Studies, for example, there's been this real effort on their part to publish diaries, to collect and publish diaries that were written. Um, and so I was able to access farmers' diaries through these institutions um, that you know, weren't available even 10, 20 years ago. And so, yeah, that was really <laughs> fortunate. And it's also really exciting um, because I think, well, I hope, I'm certainly not going to be the only one working on these. I hope that we are going to see a lot more interest in this local history, micro history, history of everyday life. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think what you said initially also illustrates how important it is to build academic networks, you know, even from sort of the level of a postgrad student a PhD student, you know, just building these networks can actually really help along the way in terms of developing a methodology, sources. So that's something I think that's important for you know, anybody watching this video um, yes. to bear in mind from the outset. Yeah. And also plan into your research that, you know, things may not go to plan. You may, yeah. you know, have the best intention in the world to find some financial association documents, but if they don't exist, you know, you find the next best thing. And ultimately it worked out better that I, I found these diaries um, because the financial associations are still relatively formal. These diaries, you know, they're, they're, they're written by the people themselves. They're very personal documents. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, better than I could have imagined when I was you know, writing up my research proposal. Yeah, no, for sure, no, definitely. And I guess kind of linked to that in terms of maybe skills to have and, and so on. If you had one piece of advice to give to students embarking on postgraduate study, particularly a doctorate, uh, what would it be and why? Um, gosh, one piece of advice only. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm going to give two, um, one of which is just be prepared to read a lot. Um, I don't think I've ever finished a meeting without giving students like multiple recommendations um, to read. But I guess the real piece of advice, and it comes back to what you were saying earlier about networks. Um, I mean, obviously, Edinburgh is a great place to study Korean studies, and it's a wonderful place to live. Um, and, you know, I I like to think that we have a really good department here. Um, however, I guess, yeah, don't only think about Edinburgh. Think about the broader community of Korean studies out there. Um, because, I mean, Asian studies tends to be a smaller discipline within the UK, and Korean studies within that is all the smaller. And one of the benefits of that, you know, being so small, I find is that there's a lot of activity and networks and a lot of, you know, research communities um, that people are very happy to, you know, build and, and, you know, interact with one another, even if we're not in the same place. Um, so there's, you know, like AXA, the Association for Korean Studies in Europe, there's the Social Science Korea Network um, that Youngmi Kim is involved in, um, and of course, you know, connections to and with scholars in Korea um, and the Korean institutes. I would say, yeah, if you want to study Korean studies at Edinburgh, um, that's wonderful. But yeah, I hope that we would help you to also, you know, go out into that wider world and take full advantage of the Korean studies community. Oh, yeah, de absolutely, definitely. And I think um, it's also probably worth, worth mentioning that there's so much good targeted student and PhD related things to get involved in, you know, such as, um, you know, UCLan do the postgraduate research seminars. It's a really good opportunity to present your work and get feedback 
from you know other academics in in the mm -hmm. Korean studies and Asian studies community. So, you know, definitely worth I think taking advantage of those opportunities as well. well that's brilliant. So, lastly, ending on a sort of more lighter uh, mm -hmm. note. So, I I think I'm right in saying you didn't live in Edinburgh before you started working at. <laughs> The university so since you have lived in Edinburgh is there mm -hmm. anything that you would recommend university related a hidden gem anything anything at all um I really like the parks and the green space um I love the meadows but also just the hills um just being able to stay really within the city um you can walk for like 15 20 minutes and you know, be in a, you know, what feels like a complete forest, um, mm. especially <laughs> during the lockdowns. Yeah. That was a real lifesaver just to have so much green space and nature nearby. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the hills, the parks and the waters of leaf, um, those kind of areas, they really make life in Edinburgh very pleasurable. Yeah, no, definitely. I think Edinburgh is a very walkable city, which mm -hmm. is nice um, and you can definitely take advantage of that. No, that's great. Well, this has been really useful, I think, to anybody watching this video. I think um, there's been some very interesting and helpful insights. So um, thank you very much, Holly, for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you.